Dr. Colbert is the director of the Respect Life Office of the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, and she has served in that capacity since 1993. She took her degrees in medicine in 1968, in psychological medicine in 1970, at the University College in Dublin, and became a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in 1973. She has studied at the Tavistock Clinic for Humane Relations in London and Cambridge University. She has extensive experience as a practicing psychiatrist and as a professor of clinical psychiatry. She has been involved in pro-life activities since 1969. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, she is the mother of six wonderful children. Dr. Marcella Colbert is going to be addressing the topic tonight on death and dying. And as we travel through in reference to our deeper understanding of medical ethics, we know that through her extensive experience in medicine and likewise in ministry toward the church, she will indeed enrich us. So let us give her a warm welcome this evening. Thank you very much, sister. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I know you've been given some notes, but I would ask you uh, not to read them as I'm speaking. It's just too embarrassing. <laughs> the purpose of the notes is to help you, if I'm not, to keep up with what I'm saying or with references. But it is, uh, and it would be better to use them that way. This evening, I'm talking to you today as a physician who was in clinical practice for many years. Psychiatry is the specialty where life and death decisions for the physician are common. Are you surprised? I was first asked to sign off on a patient having an abortion for mental health reasons in 1969. And in 1972, was told by a patient's daughter that her difficult and demented mother could die as soon as possible after a certain date, the day her will was valid. We live in strange times. So I was, became involved in pro-life quite simply from experiences of that sort. Now put simply, there are two basic understandings of what it means to be human and a person which underlie two diametrically opposed views on the discipline and practice of medicine. The first account recognizes the human person as a being with a body and spirit, a being possessed, possessing a unity which is greater than the sum of its parts, a human person, a self-conscious being, a transcendent being. This is consistent with the Hippocratic understanding of the patient a human being with a specific disease or disorder of the body, as distinct from any other uh, understanding of the human person. Hippocrates narrowed medicine by saying that diseases were associated with abnormalities in the body and nothing more. In doing this, he changed sorcerers, witchcraft uh, people, into physicians so that no longer did you go to the sorcerer or witch doctor for either killing or curing, but killing was diminished or was removed from medical practice. Indeed, it was the basis from which he developed his views on medicine as a discipline, a profession, and an art. The second account, which is very prevalent in our time, holds that all that exists is material being, and all epi or metaphenomena in humans, such as the intellect, moral conscience, and free choice, spirit, is to be accounted for as products of the body. By definition, the human being is reduced to something less, uh, something less than he is, a very clever animal, perhaps, with sentient consciousness, but not a personal subject. The person is objectified. His value is in what he has or possesses. 
being wanted or being healthy, clever, successful, having money, being independent. He does not have any intrinsic worth. One sees human life as a gift, something sacred. The other sees human life as something to be manipulated. Living out these positions is in part what we mean by the culture of life and the culture of death. And now I'm talking, for, making some comments from Humanae Vitae. The gospel of life consists in proclaiming the very person of Jesus, who is the complete truth concerning the value of human life, as revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ makes a total gift of himself, his own life for us, and through his death, Jesus reveals all the splendor and value of life. How precious man is in God's eyes, and how priceless the value of human life. Only a society which embraces and lives the basic truths of revelation can overcome the culture of death by transforming it into a culture of life. However, and our Holy Father followed, we are facing an enormous and dramatic clash between good and evil, death and life, the culture of death and the culture of life. The multiple ways attacks are made against human life, and I'm going to collect them all, abortion, euthanasia, which we're talking about tonight, contraception, suicide, population control, global poverty, great wealth and power for the few, powerless and poverty for the many, war, arms trading, drug trafficking, sexual risk taking, as hallmarks of our society speak for themselves. Now from the time of Hippocrates around 400 BC, the physician's prime duty has been to his patient. I quote, I will follow that system of regimen which according to my ability and judgment I consider for the benefit of my patients and abstain from whatsoever is deleterious or mischievous. The physician is personally responsible for his acts and his advice to his patient. He recognizes absolute and objective normative norms as well as moral norms associated with the practice of his art. Today, the physician has, and now I'm quoting the AMA, that's the American Medical Association, a social commitment to sustain life and relieve suffering. This is very different. Where the performance of one duty conflicts with the other, the preference of the patient should prevail. Withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. That's where it's from, that quote. Now, the physician is expected to no longer accept full responsibility for his patient, but to comply with the wishes of the patient or family or proxy, even against his own best judgment. Morally, everything is relative. What is death? Only the loss of the vital unity of the organism can be taken as a sign of death. I'm quoting Scretcher now. The human soul, being external, can exist without the human body. But the human body cannot exist without the human soul. That's from his paper, The Subject of a Vegetative State. Throughout history, death has been as understood as the end of earthly life, and in some way the entrance into eternal life. Christians understand it as a consequence of original sin. Disease and death are a punishment we all share, one of the ways in which we are all flawed. Death also includes in some way the separation of the soul or principle of life from the body. Christians also understand that death is transformed by Christ. Those who believe in him and die to self in him will share in his resurrection and in a new life in Christ. A secular understanding sees death as the complete end of life. Nothing exists except the material. When the body dies, the person ceases to exist. There is no ethical distinction between withdrawing and withholding life-sustaining treatment, including food and drink. 
This means that under some circumstances, the physician, the physician may in fact directly kill his patient, whether the patient wants to die or not. In the Netherlands at present, patients are being killed without their consent by their physicians. And this practice so, took place within six months of the law being, it being legal to have euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide in the Netherlands. Now dying. Dying is due to illness or old age. It is associated with physical pain and may be accompanied by suffering, fear, and despair. It is part of life. I want to distinguish between physical pain and suffering. Suffering is a spiritual problem. It's an interior matter. A person may have no pain and be suffering very severely. So you must make a distinction. All of this, dying is part of life. Helping the dying includes spiritual help, medical help, particular help with pain, and with human and personal help. The whole person has to be looked at, not just, say, a disease or pain. When death is understood as the end of everything, suffering and pain before death have no meaning. When a person is severely handicapped, although alive, their lives are seen as having no meaning or value. And by handicap here, I include dementias and many other mental states. Hence the growing practice of euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide, homicide, suicide, and blurring the distinction between killing and letting die. I will now briefly review some of the circumstances in which this arises. First of all, suicide and death. Life is inherently valuable and sacred, a gift from God. Suicide is directly taking one's own life. It is a very serious offense against God and neighbor. Suicide is associated with major psychiatric illnesses, which can be successfully treated. And it is also associated with pain, which can be successfully managed medically. You'll notice you can treat depression and you manage pain. You don't treat pain, you manage it. Despair and presumption, the belief that there is no hope for oneself before God or that you're so fine you need not worry, God will save you, are spiritual disorders where a person may be helped, but this is a much more difficult situation requiring far more than medicine has to offer, far more. When death itself is meaningless, suffering before death makes no sense. Why should a suffering person who is dying not kill themselves or be helped to do so? After all, your life is your own to be disposed of as you see fit. You see how the thinking is so different. Now, what is euthanasia? The act of the physician deliberately ending the life of a patient with or without the consent of the patient or his family is euthanasia. This is always wrong. This is a definition from the World Medical Association. The physician may allow the natural process of death to take its natural course and let the patient die, but he may not kill the patient. And that, of course, is fully compatible with Hippocrates. But when you come to the culture of death, euthanasia, Asia, is a gentle and easy death, or bringing about this gentle and easy death, especially in cases of incurable and painful diseases. That's the Oxford English Dictionary. Let's get to the AMA. For the AMA, euthanasia is the administration of a lethal agent by another person to a patient for the purposes of relieving the patient's intolerable and incurable suffering. Euthanasia is fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as a healer, would be difficult or impossible to control, and would pose serious societal risks. Now, I want you to think about this very carefully. You will note what is not said here. There's nothing about withdrawing care inappropriately 
or giving certain kinds of care inappropriately. It's only saying that direct euthanasia through lethal injection is incompatible. It is very important. It now means ways the physician assisted his patient's death uh, are allowed. Words are used which change meanings. And I've given a reference there too to the medical futility and end of life care. In preparation for this talk, I, I've actually spent a lot of the day looking up what the AMA is about today. And from the point of view of this paper, as I had preferred it, I had, had prepared it before, they've basically changed all the criteria. The whole thing is changing all the time. Secondly, their web page is almost impossible to get to the ethical uh, distinctions that you want to find. Now, there are many types of euthanasia, and it's important to remember this. Where the doctor is active, as in injection, and the patient, patient voluntarily assist, uh, asks for euthanasia, that's called physician-assisted suicide. Where the doctor is active, but the patient is not involved in the decision, it's called homicide. I think we must be very careful, because what's going on in the Netherlands at present is homicide. Homicide. It's called euthanasia, but it's homicide. The doctor is inactive in the sense that he's not doing anything, and the patient is voluntarily doing something, and that's direct suicide. In other words, the patient, the doctor doesn't do anything, but the patient doesn't give him medicine or whatever, but the patient takes it and kills himself. The doctor is inactive, and the patient is not involved. And there we're dealing with killing, letting die. Now, killing, letting die, this kind of distinction is a prudent distinction. And I think it's worth pointing out that every medical decision, particularly for diagnosis, which is the most important thing in medicine, and then for the application of appropriate treatment, is based on prudent decisions. It's based on prudence. Everything. And it's also based on double effect. You must remember that if a fa uh, it is, uh, consent is not a defense against assault, and physicians constantly assault their patients, give them poisons, open, the, open them with knives, and do all sorts of horrifying things. We explain all of that because of the doctor-patient rela uh, relationship. But you must understand that in every case, what the, patient, the doctor is doing is he is foreseeing, but not directly intending harm that will come to the patient. There is no treatment that doesn't have a side effect that in some way is not harmful. Keep that in mind. Now, killing and letting die. This is a distinction that came from Pope Pius XII, quite in the 50s. Killing is the direct act, whether it is by commission or omission, of bringing about another person's death. Letting die is foreseeing a person will die and doing nothing to either prolong or hasten death by direct means. Right and wrong can be objectively known based on natural, natural law and revelation. And this is for the physician. You must remember that the only people with a license to kill these days are physicians. Any of you went and procured an abortion, you'd be acting against the law. All that's happening in the life and death issues in medicine are happening with the approval of the medical profession and the acts involved in killing, say, an abortion or in case of euthanasia are all performed by practicing physicians. The physician accepts personal responsibility for the death of his patient insofar as is appropriate. He accepts the personal responsibility, but insofar as is appropriate. Now, when you come to the culture of death or modern medicine, the distinction between killing, letting die cannot be known for sure. Everything is doubted. Advanced directives supersede the physician's informed opinion and are acted upon. There is no ethical distinction between withdrawing and withholding life-sustaining treatment, including food and drink. That's a quote from the AMA. Now, the AMA no longer recognizes the distinctions, killing and letting die, or withdrawing, withholding life-sustaining treatments, 
These are used all the time in medical ethics as discussed by the church or in uh, Hippocratic uh, medicine. But they're no longer part of the lexicon. They have been just removed completely from the argument. The physician has general responsibility for the patient's death based on current practice, protocol, but not personal responsibility. And the references for that, and we no longer talk about killing, letting die. It's now medical futility in end of life care and allocation of limited medical resources. They are the two areas within the current medical code where you find out about killing, letting die and withdrawing, withholding. This is very serious, you know. It's very serious. Now, withdrawing food and drink, and I'm talking about our Holy Father, John Paul II. Food and drink are normative for life. They should never be actively removed, which is direct killing by starvation and dehydration. However, this is not absolute in that a dying patient may be unable to take food and drink. He's unable and he refuses. And towards death, fluids may flood the patient's tissues. This is part of the dying process itself, making things worse. And in those kinds of cases, you would withdraw fluid. So it's not an absolute prohibition. You must be careful about that. However, when it comes to the culture of death, or modern medicine, it is assumed that food and drink are part of treatment. This is another way of saying food and drink are extraordinary means of care. Withdrawing food and drink is a legitimate form of treating the dying. And I quote, our AMA opposes legislation that would presume to prescribe the patient's preference for artificial hydration and nutri in nutrition in situations where the patient lacks decision-making capacity and an advance directive or living will. You will notice that is the only place at present on the current uh, site that I can find nutrition and hydration. That is that the AMA is opposed to what has just been sent to me today from the Texas uh, the, our own Texas Catholic Conference, where we're trying to get advanced directives that uh, food and nutrition, nutrition and hydration are part of normal care. The AMA opposes that. Now think of that in relation to what they mean by euthanasia. Redrawing nutrition and food is not euthanasia. That is only when you give a direct injection. Now, the culture of death. Now, ordinary, extraordinary means when a patient is dying. Ordinary means include food and drink, pain relief, human contact, spiritual comfort, usual medications, including antibiotics. It may include use of a, respir a respirator. It may or may not. A respirator per se is a means, it's not an end. Because someone is taken off a respirator does not mean they're being killed. That's very important. Taking someone off a respirator may be facing the inevitable that they're dying. And that usually is what is happening. Now, the fish, physician is not really accepting or recognizing a person is dying. And this is when we get to ordinary, extraordinary care. And this is sort of the sweet case, if you like. The physician is not really accepting or recognizing a person is dying and engages in heroic surgery or other interventions. This is a, an error of judgment on the physician's part. And as a matter of fact, and on deciding in practice what is reasonable intervention, there is amazing confusion at present. The physician accepts let's take, that his patient is dying. But he does not realize that medical intervention has changed to care of the dying. In other words, he can only deal with the patient when it's acute care. One of the biggest problems in practice today, just in practical matter, is that dying patients are brought in as a matter of great emergency to the emergency room.
If you go into the emergency room, you'll be treated as an emergency. When your emergency is over, you will be discharged. So you get this awful circle of people going into the emergency room, coming out, and nobody recognizes that the patient is dying and should go to the hospice. Do you understand what I mean? This is a really, in practice, is a real problem. And that requires great education on the part of the laity, of ordinary people. The doctor himself, who only likes to deal with acute practice, he will end up avoiding the dying patient and no medical or spiritual interventions are offered except death itself. This is very common. Now, I'm going to, however, now count, uh, give you a, an example that was given. I tried to look into all of this, uh, particularly in the question of nutrition and hydration today. And I, the closest I came was an excerpt from an essay written on this subject as a, a advice for physicians. And it goes like this. And it's about putting in a, a gastric tube. Not placing the tube in context would eliminate any chance of recovery. This is a patient who's ac acutely ill. Now, if you don't put in the tube, there will not be any chance of recovery, but would permit him to die a natural death from the effects of his stroke. Did you hear that? A natural death. In other words, the fact that you haven't put in the tube and are not therefore feeding him doesn't mean he's dying from starvation or dehydration. He's per he is permitted to die a natural death from the effects of his stroke. This is how the profession is thinking. The immediate therapeutic question then is whether to place the tube to permit long-term artificial hydration and nutrition. The patient's uh, wife inquired, we can't just stop feeding him, can we? In fact, not placing a PEG tube is a legal and ethical option. It is the result of his stroke. He can no longer nourish himself by eating and drinking. The US Supreme Court in the Cruzan case established that artificial hydration and nutrition is a form of medical, medical therapy and can be refused by competent or incompetent patients. It's the US Supreme Court has said you can do this, so it is normative. This is not a medical decision you will notice. It's a law that the medical profession is complying with. It's a bad law that the medical profession is complying with. Now, physician-assisted suicide. The dying should be cared for and their difficulties adequately diagnosed. Depression, pain, despair, and so on. Most high-profile cases of PAS are of women with chronic diseases such as MS, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. They're not dying patients. So what you see with Dr. Kervorkian were all female patients who were not dying. They were chronically ill. Now, the culture of death. The patient's request to die is simply accepted at face value. No medical intervention or appropriate referral is sought. The physician prescribes medication which could kill the patient, although it often does not. I should tell you that giving people an overdose to kill them in PAS isn't always successful. About half the time it's not. The patient takes the medication himself. The physician is in collusion with the patient in their death, which is a direct killing. Now, let's talk about advanced directives and living wills. I'm sorry there's so many of these circumstances, but that is what this a uh, whole debate is about, and you have to know every one of these in order to be able to pick your way through it. The physician hospital must do no evil in following advanced directives. That is when the patient writes in advance what they want done with them in the case of their dying or their death. The patient cannot foresee the future or be expected to fully understand current medical procedures or language. Patients are incapable, of, in my view, of making advanced directives. In advanced directives, patients do not ask 
or believe they are asking to be killed by direct means. Patients always think direct advance, uh, directives are for them. Nothing could be further from the truth. Advanced directives are for the hospital and physician. They are used as the basis for patients' end-of-life care in the hospital or hospice. Do not resuscitate can become very problematic. Persistent vegetative state. Now this, we're getting into difficult water here. A persistent vegetative state is a very new name for a very old diagnosis, chronic organic brain syndrome, very common to people like myself in the kind of practice I did. Serious brain damage occurs with loss of cognition, the ability to know, loss of perception, uh, in other words, to uh, see what's going on around you, and with the ability and the loss and the loss of the ability to communicate, can't speak, the loss of either our relations, loss of volition or loss of memory in a patient with an intact brain stem. The patient can breathe, support their own circulation. There are many reports of individual patients who, having recovered from this type of state, tell of being conscious while in this state. Chronic brain syndrome takes many forms. The patient is not dying, to the contrary. She is living with a chronic disability. And Terry Schiavo is a case in point. Terry Schiavo is a case in point. However, when we get to modern medicine, life-sustaining treatment is now defined as any treatment that serves to prolong life without revising the underlying medical condition, without reversing the underlying medical condition. That's the AMA. Now, strictly applied, this definition, uh, this definition dismisses all those patients who are chronically ill from medical care. If there's a gap, for example, you have MS, there's nothing you can get that's going to make you better. But you may live for 20 years, right? More. Does that mean that you're now a dying patient? According to this, it does. Further, without these capacities, and I'm referring back to the other area where we spoke about the loss of cognition, of perception, of communication, of volition, etc. Without these capacities, a person is no longer a person, but a lower form of human life, and although living, may be killed directly. This is always the underlying assumption. This is a redefinition of what it means to be a human being. It's a very serious, slippery slope to killing others with brain syndromes such as Alzheimer's, Huntington's chorea, chronic schizophrenia, severe mental handi handicap, etc. Um, when coupled with advanced directives and withholding food and fluids, this is becoming a common form of euthanasia. The person has, is not brain dead, but they're in this persistent vegetative state. There's an awful lot more to be said about this, but there's only so much we can do. I now come to brain dead. I don't want to say too much about this, because you're going to get a full lecture next week on this topic, but just a few things. Our Holy Father, John Paul II, set the moral criteria which must be fulfilled to establish this diagnosis. A person's death is a single event involving spirit, soul, and body. The defense and promotion of the integral good of the human person must be maintained. Informed consent of the donor must be obtained. Physicians who determine death must not be involved in organ transplants and vital organs may only be removed after death. No commercialization in human organs may occur. Now you notice we're talking about brain dead, but immediately we're also talking about transplant. And that is because the whole question of brain dead arose in the context of wanting organs for transplantation. So it all came from, uh, what's his name, Bernard, uh, 1969, when he did his first heart transplant. 
I make a point here. Until recently, physicians described death after the fact. In fact, doctors were only brought into signing death certificates because it was thought that maybe if they had to go through you know, a coroner's court and all of this, it would mean that uh, not so many people would be buried alive. Uh, if you have, I, um, I suppose, old enough and come from an old enough country to have heard more stories of people's coffins found on the floor before the, the day after their wake because they had woken up in the coffin. So it's worth remembering that bringing the medical profession into this in the coroner's court was to prevent accidents. Now, so our di we were never asked to diagnose death. We were only asked to dis say that death had occurred after the fact. Now, physicians are asked to diagnose death and often before it occurs. This is a very radical shift. The medical criteria for death, uh, for brain death, were developed by the President's Commission in JAMA, and that gives a date, in 1981. And they follow upon the so-called Harvard criteria. To date, there are over 36 versions and many, many more of the Harvard criteria. It's very strange that you have criteria for death, knowing when a person is brain dead, that constantly shift. And you're asked to diagnose a state that is not a state that a physician is actually, he's capable of saying the person is dead, but how do we actually make a diagnosis of death? It's very strange, I don't, that's wrong. Okay. Remember, brain death arose from a desire for fully perfused organs for transplantation. Death is synonymous, in this case, with death of the body and its ability to function, particularly loss of brain function. The cessation and irreversibility of all brain function, including the brain stem, must be established. I will point out that brain dead is a more stringent criteria than any of the criteria in any other circumstance. This is the most stringent criteria. However, even if the brain stem is destroyed and the patient's respiration and circulation have been continuously supported, one must ask, is the patient really dead? There's no doubt removing the vital organs will certainly bring about his death. Um, and this brings us back to this question, can a body be alive with organs that are good to be transplanted? when in fact the soul has left the body. And it, there's a very interesting tie in here with metaphysics, that's obviously your problem, not mine. But I'd like to tell you a little more that's going on at present that adds to this. And this is the, the notion of encephalatic, what's wrong with my main? Anencephalic neonates as organ donors. An anencephalic child is a child born with no uh, brain. It has a brain stem very often, but no brain. And uh, anencephaly is a congenital abscess of major portion of the brain, skull, and scalp. And, as, and I'm now quoting from the AMA. Anencephalic neonates are thought to be unique from other brain damaged beings, and listen to this, because of a lack of past consciousness with no potential for future consciousness. Physicians may provide anencephalic neonates with ventilator insistence and other medical therapies that are necessary to sustain organ perfusion and viability until such time as a determination of death can be made in accordance with accepted medical standards, relevant law, and regional organ procurement organization policy. They're saying when the child is alive, because it has not had consciousness and has no memory, it's basically dead. Isn't that what that says? That's exactly what it says. So anencephalic children are now being harvested before they die, maintained on machines and what have you, for their organs. This is very, this is serious stuff. I keep saying that, don't I? <laughs> um, and you notice the sort of political thing, all the, you have to concur with these laws and these standards and the criteria, but there are no principles underlying this. Retrieval and transplantation of the organs of anencephalic infants are ethically permissible 
only after such determinant of death is made and only in accordance with the Council's guidelines for transplantation. And there's a whole lot of references to that. So you see how bit by bit there's intrusion on accepted standards where others are contradicting. Okay, terminal sedation. Pain can always be treated adequately without unconsciousness. I want to emphasize this. One of the areas of medical practice that is most misunderstood is pain management. The problem of patients who don't have proper pain management is that their doctors don't know what they're doing. And the second reason is that they are being moved from physician to physician to physician, from one service to another, so there's no continuity of care, and therefore there's no establishment of a proper baseline. It is a fundamental of basic medical training to know how to maintain pain, help the patient with pain. Specialties like uh, psychiatry, interesting enough, we have a lot to offer because very often patients are depressed and have many other problems of that sort. And when that is helped and properly helped, their whole pain perception goes down and the suffering goes down. But there are people called pain specialists and if anybody has a relative who is not having proper pain managed, the first thing you do is you change your physician. Look at the people who are looking after you. That's the first thing. This should never occur in normal medical practice. Now, there are a couple of rare exceptions to a patient needing unconsciousness to be treated. The first is thalamic pain and some very severe bony pain. Human suffering must be recognized and the person helped with their suffering. And direct withdrawal of food and water is always unacceptable. This is in terminal sedation. But what's going on at present? Terminal sedation, in fact, is the use of high doses of sedatives and painkillers to relieve extremes of physical distress. Its purpose is to render the patient unconscious to relieve suffering until the patient dies from his or her disease process and their complications. You do not give analgesics, dihydrocodone, whatever, to a person who is suffering. That's like saying to them, why don't you go on the streets and get a shot of heroin, right? That is not the way you treat suffering. And you've got to make the distinction in the diagnosis. Now, the AMA Code of Medical Ethics is silent on the topic of terminal sedation. Increasing doses of narcotic medication is prescribed over a period of days, not only for physical pain, but also for suffering. Food and drink are withdrawn, and the patient dies in three or four days. That's called a medical protocol. It's not called euthanasia, but as far as I'm concerned, it is. And finally, you'll be glad to know I've come to the end of this. Not quite. Futile care. This is new again on the horizon. The informed medical decision that further treatment is of no help to the patient and indeed may harm him is what we mean by futile care. It is prolonging death, not giving life. And in fact, it refers right back to Pope Pius XII in his distinction between killing and letting die. Though that is not to refer to in the AMA. Now, the phys physician may refuse to continue with the current regimen or to treat a patient. Every physician must be free to refuse to treat a patient. If a patient comes and does not want the treatment offered, the physician can withdraw from that. It is absolutely essential. If the physician does not believe that the treatment is going to help the patient, they can also withdraw from that and refuse to do it. The patient is dying. The patient's dying is being prolonged. Remember that. There are a lot of cases that have been going around recently. There were two down at the medical center this last year. And both of them were cases where the patient's dying was being prolonged through the insistence of their relatives and others. They were not cases where the patient was being killed. You can't take a person off a respirator without killing them. It's very important not to get confused. The, whether you kill someone or not has to do with intention. It doesn't have to do with the machine. 
We don't live forever. The patient's dying is being prolonged, and I think that is when Pius XII was first asked, when he spoke to the anesthesiologists about this, it was because of the fear just after respirators were used in the emergency rooms that in fact patients dying was being prolonged, and the physicians wanted guidelines from him in order to know when to stop. And that is perfectly legitimate. The patient is unresponsive to current treatment. If a patient is unresponsive, it doesn't mean that they can be killed. The patient requires comfort care, including food and hydration, bed and or nursing care, current medication and pain medication. So you've got to be very careful about this new thing called futile care because it's beginning to look very much like just withdrawing everything. And then there are some other things about all of this is looked under nowadays under the allocation of limited medical resources. Now that's a very interesting place to put the care of a dying patient because ultimately it's all been brought down to the needs, competing needs of different patients whereby only a utilitarian ethic can come up with the right answer. Let's say a little bit finally about the cost of death and dying. Each human life made by God in his image is inherently valuable, whatever its age, state, or condition. Healthcare is a human right. Healthcare services are not businesses, hospitals and hospices and insurance companies. The healthcare system is for the patient. All persons in a society should have adequate access to healthcare. And our society must find ways to provide for our growing elderly pop population other than by killing them. And that is just stating a sort of fundamental norms in this. However, the culture of death sees the value of human life based on extrinsic factors, beauty, wealth, independence, but most importantly, med mental competence. They also see healthcare as a privilege it's not a privilege. Healthcare can be a for-profit enterprise in our society. And honestly, it's very questionable whether healthcare should ever be the way you make money. It is not a profit business. Up until very recently, all healthcare uh, institutions were run by the church or by charitable means, and they were not for-profit enterprises until the last 10, 30, uh, maybe 20, 30 years. And the bottom line, by that I mean money, determines the care the patient gets. Hospice care for Medicaid, Medicare patients is about three months. If you have private insurance and you go into the hospice, you'll be dead in 10 days. And that's when the money runs out. This is actually true. You will die when your money runs out. It's quite simple. In conclusion, Hippocrates understood the concept of disease as central to the principles that constitute medicine as a discipline, as follows. The patient develops abnormal symptoms and signs in body or mind, which are due to physical disorder. Diseases show specific symptoms and signs in a cluster, natural histories and common outcomes. That's called the syndrome. A disease is not under the control of the patient. Patients don't, diseases happen to patients. They don't, there's not something you bring upon yourself. From the beginning, medical practice has included the diagnosis and treatment of trauma, surgery, obstetrics, handicap, and pain as part of the physician's concern. And by these criteria, major psychiatric illnesses fulfill these criteria. In practice, Many difficulties are brought to the physician, which are not necessarily related to disease. The greatest stability for the physician is to be able to distinguish or diagnose diseases from each other and from other entities, and to offer advice and care even when the need is not specifically medical. However, the World Health Organization in 1948 redefined health in the following way as a state of complete physical, social, and mental well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. This definition covers almost all of life, 
Indeed, it is hard to see what aspect of life is not included under the definition. Hence the terms, the medicalization of life and the therapeutic society. We won't discuss that today. This utopian redefinition of medicine is very dangerous. It is a public health concept which deals with populations and units of mass data, not patients, as individual persons. This type of thinking has led to clean water, control of sewage, vaccinations, and other great benefits to society. And I'm talking about dealing with uh, disease concepts of, in relation to populations. It has also led to population control and eugenics, contraception, abortion, and euthanasia, all under the heading of health care. And really what we're dealing with today is that, is taking a public health approach to the disabled and those who are not quite functioning and saying, well, just as you get rid of those who are sick through vaccinations, you can also get rid of persons who are affecting our, our society. Killing is, is becoming just another medical procedure surrounded with protocols and procedures all provided by the AMA. The physician until now has worked with and been responsible for his patient. Working with populations of people allows for a utilitarian ethic, which in current medical practice has become the ethical norm. Thank you all very much. We'd like to thank Dr. Colbert for enriching us in a number of different aspects as we approach the topic of death and dying. Uh, if you have a question, she would be happy to entertain that, and I'll ask Dr. Colbert to repeat the question uh, as, you, uh, as you say it. We have one person with a mic over here, and you want to start over here? You wanna... Uh, doctor, I'd like to ask you, if I may, if the uh, is the archdiocese educating the pastor and the priest at the churches? Because uh, I know there was what 200 and some odd parishes in the archdiocese, and the couple of priests that I've asked, they they seem like they're not well well versed on a lot of these matters. Could you comment on that, please? First of all, I do think the diocese is teaching the priests. However, this is a very tricky area that we're talking about. This is, I mean, very few people, what I find is when you're talking about medical ethics or when you're talking about ethics, the philosophers are dealing with it. When you're talking about the law, the lawyers are dealing about it. And the, when you're talking about, yes, we're talking about medical ethics and doctors are not involved seriously in the discussion where I myself find most of what comes my way, even through the pro-lifers, in many times very objectionable because it's not taking into account the subtleties involved. You need to be very well educated in a wide number of areas to be able to deal with this. Are we trying to do something about it? You bet. This is the topic I talk about, usually not as complicated as this, uh, more time than any other. And I think it's going to become more and more common. I think, for example, this whole question of knowing when, you know, hospice assisting from acute medical care will cut down an awful lot of problems. And I think we can do more to educate the laity. Yeah. Um, uh, I understand. I, over here. Over, over here. Over here. I understand that um, infants, uh, anencephalic infants, can be kept alive um, mechanically so that their organs uh, are perfused uh, enough, to be, enough to be given as uh, transplants to uh, other infants. Is there any guidance um, medically by the church or in the civil courts as to how long these infants can be kept alive? The point is these children are either are born dead or are born alive. The AMA directors I just read to you say that while they're alive, because they have not had a history, they have not been conscious, they have not had memories, 
they are in fact dead. They may, their organs may be uh, harvested. It doesn't make any distinction. They're sort of the living dead. They are put on the machine to perfuse their organs to make sure that they're as healthy as possible. But they're actually not being let die and then being harvested. Um, and I think that's what that quote I, my, I read. My question is even darker than that. Uh, would it be, um, would eyebrows be raised or would silver cords awaken if some, some child were to be kept alive for an indefinite period of time so that their organs could mature for a harvest at a later point? Oh, that is, well, that, that, that's a speculation. Uh, I think that um, we can't even go there at this stage. I mean, that's diabolical. Um, the fact is, it's pretty bad, if you don't mind my saying, that you don't have to have the child die naturally before you harvest its organs, uh, but that you can keep it alive until such time as the organs are necessary. And uh, that, in my view, is going over a step that we haven't gone over before. And it's, uh, it's the same as saying a living person. It's admitting, in fact, that a living person, because they're not a person in this, in a notion under than our notion of person, because they don't have either relations, they don't have the capacity for consciousness and memory, that those are for cognition, that those persons are not humans. They're not truly human beings. They're a lesser form who may be harvested. That's, in my view, horrible. I wonder if, uh, as a case study, you might expand on the Terry Schiavo case from the standpoint of the court case, the judge, the husband, uh, the parents willing to care for her. Well, um, this is a... I have to think about it. The first thing is that whatever caused her mental incapacity, and there's all sorts of questions about that going right back to the very beginning. She was suffering from a chronic brain syndrome. Her brain stem was fully intact. She had all sorts of some capacity for sentient consciousness. She seems to have some ability to recognize and her family. She wasn't able to give uh, to verbalize. I mean, she had a lot of aphasias and what have you. She couldn't speak, she couldn't think. At least we know she could, we don't know that, but she could have been thinking inside for all we know. And she was directly euthanized by removing water and uh, uh, in, a, in a line with the, uh, with the law as it stands. I mean, it was all legal. But it was, she was in a persistent vegetative state. And, she, and the fact that her parents, her parents weren't her direct guardians. Her husband, you know, there was a lot about money in this case. I don't want to go into that, but there was a lot about money in the background, and the husband had access to money if she died. And I think that that part was never brought out. And it should have been. The whole, that, that case is an absolute tragedy. But at the same time, it's a warning sign to all of us of what's actually going on day after day within the law with no comment. And without food and water, she lasted 15 days, that about is, 15, 13 to 15 days. That is incredible. But that's what everybody lasts without water, food and water. It always takes that length. That's what's so terrible. I mean, you have a perfectly modern hospital or facility, and you have either a child from infanticide who's not been fed, been left aside to die, and it takes up to 15 days. It's, it's absolutely. Here. Uh, yes. Uh, this has to do with uh, hydration and nutrition. Uh, back in 1990, uh, the majority of the Texas Catholic bishops issued a document on hydration and nutrition. <laughs> And also, in comparing that document to the, what John Paul said in March of 2004, it sounds like there's a conflict when it comes to proportionate, disproportionate care with hydration and nutrition. Could you comment on that? Well, I'm not a philosopher, but I think that there were certain philosophical, uh, this document uh, was prepared by people who had a philosophical understanding that was closer to a utilitarian or a proportionalist way of reasoning these things out than to the way in which our Holy Father would reason them out. I think that that is something that we don't talk about anymore, I mean, to be frank. 
I have, it, it's irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant because the Holy Father has spoken and Bishop Scretcher has spoken. We now have this marvelous institution, the Ac Academy for Life. Bishop Scretcher is, an, is so superior in his thinking and the whole, all the people he has gathered together and the documents he is producing from the Vatican are the guidelines for all of the kind of practice we should have within the church. So it's all been superseded. It's irrelevant. Also, we must remember philosophical speculation is what it is. There's too much engaging by all of us who are incompetent in that area in philosophical speculation in these areas. We should really look always to the church and what the church states to be absolutely sure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, there has been conflicting views expressed or apparently conflicting views expressed on the question of, of antibiotics uh, last week and this week. I'm thinking particularly of a case where someone is truly terminally ill. Let's say that he's dying of cancer and may live as much as three or four weeks. Um, and he gets pneumonia. And uh, some people say antibiotics are ordinary means and must be used to treat the pneumonia. Other people would say, uh, I've heard it said when I was a child 75 years ago, uh, that pneumonia was the old man's friend. That's right. <laughs> uh, do you have any views on this? I do. Uh, I think the first thing is that because something is made ordinary means doesn't mean it's compulsory. The individual physician has to make the decision what is the best thing for his patient at this time. In some times when some, somebody is dying, it may be appropriate for pr matters of distress, for example, to ha not have a person have too much difficulty breathing if they got pneumonia. In another case, it may be totally different and that it would be inappropriate. I think what we have to remember is that all of these principles are not commands, they're not laws, they're principles to guide us in making moral decisions. And all moral decisions ultimately are prudent decisions, and particularly medical ones, they're all prudent decisions. So there's no conflict. I would be inclined to agree with you, though, that pneumonia is the old man and the old woman's friend, too. We all have to die of something. Though it is true people die of old age. They just die. I saw a patient once when I was quite young, um, I mean in the profession, and he came into the hospital. He was put into, there was nothing very much wrong with him, but he was put into the acute bed because it was all that was where people were dying. And he started to get into a panic. And he was dead in about a week. He just died of fright, I think. It's the most phenomenal thing I've ever seen. I was very young, and there were nothing like the helps in psychiatry, and I knew nothing about psychiatry then. But it, it floored the physician in church. I mean, you, when you're in practicing medicine, you see all sorts of things. You know, there's no definitive, it's always this way. How are you doing? How are you? Good. Um, would you um, say that the uh, technology in the last 20 years have exploded in the sense that it's given us so many cures, so many uh, great uh, treatments, um, actually has affected the lifespan of the average person in this country, and is expected in the next 30 years to increase it up to 100, 125, bringing us back to Abraham, I guess. And uh, if that's true, wouldn't it be said that the uh, way that healthcare is being handled today via business is contributing to that factor. And so therefore, business has, been, has a good side to this as well, to healthcare, that uh, doesn't get the credit that it deserves. Not to mention, it's becoming more effective. Uh, you look at all the other socialistic countries that have healthcare to everyone, your alternative to a treatment is death. I'll have to come back to you on the second part of that question, uh, just to be sure I understand what you mean. The great advances in medical care have started since 1940s with antibiotics. The 1950s, we had the, uh, there were all the anti-psychiatric -psych drugs which have brought about immense change in the whole side of everything. Painkillers, all the use of painkillers, anesthesia, which has been coming from 
the, you know, the turn of the 19th century coming in. And then there were things like steroids. I don't care what anybody, unbelievable changes and the understanding of hormones and some of those are the treatments that we now all take for granted as normative norms. When I went into practice, people died of all the time of diabetes. It was regard, asthma was a killer. I mean, they're just gone. And now it doesn't happen. What the big problem I think is not in the, the treatments are unbelievable and it's wonderful we have them. What we have is an inability to think morally on how to use the, tech, the technology we've got. Pius XII was talking about the respirator when it came to killing, letting die, and right today we're talking about it because people, and it's not because the respirator has changed, though it's more effective, it's just that people don't know how to think morally. They don't know what it means to be human and a person. They don't know what's valuable in relation to be human and a person. Now, we are facing a horrible dilemma, and that is the care of the aged. I'm a baby boomer, a very, as old a baby boomer as you can be. There are more and more people. I have MS, so I have, I, for a long time, I've been taking a wheelchair in the airport. And it used to be a lonely journey, all on my own, for quite some time. Now, the guys know how to have two wheelchairs together and run you off down. There are up to seven people on a flight when you get on to have wheelchairs, and the numbers is going to grow and grow and grow. We have a huge burgeoning elderly population, and we have no kids behind to look after them. Medicine is facing an immense crisis, which is the care of the aged, with nobody to care for those people. And it's going to break the bank. The bank is, if you got rid of the last two years of medical care, which are the most, they take over 60 plus percent of all medical expenditure. Do you understand? You would solve the medical problem, the, the problem of provision of care. So we have this thing facing us, in cost effectiveness, if we get rid of the last two years of life, we get rid of our medical dilemma, right? So we're facing, from an economic point of view, euthanasia right down the spout. And I think that that's the kind of thing that's difficult. It's not because of the treatments, it's because we don't know what's valuable. It's a moral dilemma. I, have a, I am inclined to have great reservations about medicine. Medicine is a virtue. I think the beginning of the deterioration of medicine has been the fee per item of service. In other words, instead of being given a professional fee for everything you did, for all the things you did in any given uh, visit, suddenly doctors got pieces and it turned the medical profession, profession into a money maker. And I honestly think that is completely wrong. I'm completely opposed to the fee per item of service, which I suppose puts me right out of the limb, but I always practiced for uh, a salary, and it never interfered with my standard of living or the respect I had or the way in which I treated patients. I think the medical profession and the nursing and other people have to get back to the old roots and remember what we're doing. It's a privilege to serve people by caring for them when they're sick. We should not make money out of the misery of other people. Does that make sense? I think your math is a little off, but that's okay. <laughs> Where? I may be showing my ignorance, but does our diocese have a, an ethicist that families who are encountering problems can go to? Mostly uh, people refer to me on issues of this sort. And if I don't know, I find somebody else who does to advise me. <laughs> But mostly it all comes to me. I get up to two questions a week, usually on end-of-life decisions. I get a lot of questions about end-of-life decisions. We would like to thank Dr. Colbert for a splendid presentation. Certainly a vast experience she has shared with us and many different aspects of the topic she has approached this evening. We'd like to remind you that outside, Veritas Books has a book display, and likewise we have tapes uh, from lectures given by Father Kelly, Dr. Hahn, 
and Dr. Jean Kitchell. Uh, these are CD and T DVD versions. Next week, uh, Dr. Joseph Graham will again be approaching the topic of medical ethics. Dr. Graham is a professor here in the philosophy department and president of Texas Right to Life. So again, a person with a vast experience in this arena of medical ethics and philosophy. So we hope to see you again next Wednesday. Thank you so much for coming.